Marsha Wolfson Ray, and I'm the artist who created the sculptures and the drawings on the walls. And I appreciate you showing up for the talk. And there's a couple of the thank yous I want to do right at the beginning. One is to Jim Arndt. He's been great and treated me royally. And I want to thank Coastal Carolina University because they're sponsoring this. And I want to um, thank, she doesn't know this, but Rebecca Bryan because um, Jim explained how he has the funds for, for doing all this. And so my thanks to all, everybody. Um, I'll start with a little bit of history. Um, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, and I, in Baltimore, is fortunate to have a pretty good art school, art college, Maryland Institute College of Art. So when I got done high school, uh, I went there. And it was a very good school, and I was always interested in art, and it was a pretty serious place for art. And I got to take a variety of uh, subjects, but I mainly uh, focused on painting and figurative sculpture, which I really loved. But when I got done, I graduated, I had been in school, like high school and then college, and I wanted a break. So I did a few different jobs, and one of them was um, working as a substitute teacher in the Baltimore public school system. And I realized, after I got done college, that I hadn't given a lot of thought to how I was going to kind of support myself. So when I started doing the substitute teaching, I thought, well, I will maybe go back and get my education credits so I could be a teacher. And um, it wasn't much. I just had to maybe go for one semester to get the credits and then do the student teaching one semester. So I did that. And then I applied for a job in the Baltimore City School System. And fortunately, the person who was in charge of it that time, I asked her if I could be hired part time because I was really interested in continuing doing art. And she said yes. And they, I don't know if they still do this, do this, but they gave you benefits, and I taught basically two days a week. And so this worked, because when I was, after college, I had, didn't do any art for a little while, and then I kind of got back into it. I, I started doing um, ceramics, which I loved, but then I thought, well, how am I going to have a kiln? I just have an apartment, blah, blah, blah. So I started drawing and painting. And at that point, I discovered, I don't know who knows Paul Clay's work, but I fell in love with Paul Clay's work. And I got highly influenced by it. And so it entered my head that maybe I would go back to graduate school because um, I had the time. And they also, when you teach in the school system, they, um, in order to get your raises and all, you have to uh, keep getting credits and degrees. So I applied to Towson University, which is in Baltimore, and I applied again to the Maryland Institute. And um, I pretty much figured that I was going to get into Towson and that it was kind of affordable for me. But I, I, on a whim, I applied to the Maryland Institute. And they don't traditionally hire or enroll your, you as a graduate if you've been in their undergraduate program. So I knew there wasn't much chance of that. But uh, I don't know if anybody's noticed that life is really completely unpredictable, pretty much. They rejected me at Towson. I didn't get in. And then they gave me a fellowship to go to Maryland Institute, which covered pretty much the whole tuition. So that was really a fortunate break. I went back to the Maryland Institute. And the way they worked it was they, um, they give you a studio space. And you had a lot of freedom. So they would have, um, you, maybe I took one or two academic courses, but they didn't require much. But they did 
expect you to really work at your art, to really be dedicated to it, which wasn't a problem because I've always loved doing art. I went in there doing paintings, and I came out doing the work you're going to see on the screen. So somewhere in there, things transformed. The paintings started to, I started to glue things to the surface and build them up and, you know, so I think the uh, end thing was I was really prone to be three-dimensional. <laughs> and I think if you are prone to be three-dimensional, you find out one way or another. So um, that's what I did. And um, the, the pictures, I started weaving the paper, then I started building up three-dimensional forms with the paper. And then one day, I went out to a field outside of Baltimore, and I gathered some corn stalks. They had really already been cut down, so I got the stubs. And I built a piece. And then I, the next thing is I called a tree felling company. You're going to see the piece I did from that. And I collected like three co carloads full of twigs from a tree they took down. And from there, I kind of never looked back. I just kept gathering and building and gathering and building. And fortunately, um, I would go over to the Eastern Shore and I got a little piece of property. So I had a base over there. So when I went and gathered, I had a place to like work in the summer outside and I had a, um, I had a place to store stuff. So it worked out pretty well. Um, the one thing I would like to say is that going to school for art. I don't know whether it seems important to you or not, but what it does is it makes you examine why you're doing art and where your motivation is coming from. So it was a really good thing. They pressure you and expect you, but I think that my, my work might not have evolved like it did if I hadn't gone back to school. So I was, um, I think it, it worked pretty well. Um, I had made a couple notes, uh, let's see. School helped me develop the habit of questioning my motivations for why I was doing what I was doing, it made me examine it, my art more closely. Once I was, you know, I went through an evolution, like everybody does in art, in school, and one day the, uh, I went from the paper then to building things out of found stuff, and the thing of it is, is when you're working by yourself, there might be a tendency to think, oh, this is pretty good. And so what you, happens to you when you go to like college for art or school for art is you get a different perspective, like from your instructors. So one memorable thing that happened to me was, and my husband will remember this, is one day the uh, professor who ran the program, his name was Babe Shapiro, and he came up to one of my pieces, and I, was, I had worked on it. It was like strings tied in a box and all this painting, and I thought, oh, yes. And he came up in front of the picture, and he looked at it for a little while, and this is what he did. <laughs> well, I kind of went home and cried. But it was really important because it forced me to look at my work in a way I had never done before. And it gave me a perspective that I believe I wouldn't have had just working on my own. So the moral of my story is, take advantage of your time here at college. You know, um, take as many different courses as you can because you discover what you like to do and maybe what you don't like to do, or you discover what you're good at, and sometimes you discover what you're not good at, and that's the thing you pursue. So um, I guess that's
kind of what I would like to leave you with. I have a whole lot of other notes, but I'm not going to go into them. I'm going to just start showing my pictures, and I'm going to go pretty quickly through them because there's a lot. And um, I promise you, if I see anybody nodding off, I'll wind down, okay? So, um, and then I just want to give a shout out to one person who has really made this all possible, and that is my husband, David Ray. He has supported me in so many different ways. I just want to acknowledge that. So, let's see if I can work this. Um, this is the twig spiral that I made in graduate school, and basically the first piece I ever made. Uh, this is um, camouflage. I don't know if it would be possible to turn the lights off for a moment. It might show up a little better. Um, what I started doing when I would go over the Eastern Shore, I would collect anything I really, that was available. And I did, all, thank you, Jim. I did all my collecting pretty much in the fall and the winter and early spring. So the, the work, the materials I collected were always already, they had had their season and they were over with. So this is camouflage. This is called jostle. Um, the materials in this are, um, something called dog fennel and phragmites. Phragmites is an invasive plant in Maryland that grows everywhere. People pretty much hate it, so nobody minded me taking it. Um, the dog fennel is a, a weed that goes pretty tall with little leaves. I don't know if it comes in here, it's green, but when it dies, there, you know, I got in the habit of, do of collecting it because one year there was fields and fields of it, and it served the same purpose I'll show you of something else I, there were years I couldn't find it, so I had to find something else that would do the trick. This is called range, that's bark, pine bark, and again, that's, it's called dog fennel. This is stand, uh, goes on the wall, and that is all dog fennel. Um, this is called horizon. And I would build armatures and then start working on the surface of the piece. Electricity. Uh, I do not know what this is. Some of the materials I don't know. This is bark and um, it's called diamond. And it pretty much um, drove me crazy because uh, the tree that sheds its bark, I don't know, um, Exactly, um, I'm not sure what it's called, but it, it sheds its bark at one point, and I would go around collecting it, and I thought, oh, it's all curled up, I'll just flatten it out. Well, flattening it out was, you know, I'd flatten it out when it was wet and weigh it down, and as soon as I took the weights off, it curled right back up. So, this piece took a little bit of dedication, but um, I think, um, Sometimes the struggle in art is actually the fun part. Uh, temple. Uh, this is called Resist. That's, I, went, I did some work in an arboretum, I'll show you a couple pieces, and they had something called Sensitive Fern. And again, this was like late fall, winter. So I gathered that, and the straight stuff is um, dog fennel again. This is called Wave. I think the material might be scotch broom and phragmites. This is flame. That's switchgrass um, and cornstalks. This, the structure's out of cornstalks. Uh, like cornstalks are like turn a beautiful golden color and they're strong because like in the inside of this cornstalk, corn it's like styrofoam. You wouldn't realize it, but they're beautiful and they're strong, which for a sculpture are two great qualities. Um, this is called Lacuna, and uh, I think that I go over to the Eastern Shore of Maryland, and there's a lot of um, crabbing. So I think I was sometimes your ideas filter in through your unconscious. I looked, did this piece, I got an idea for it, and I did it, and then I realized, ah, it looks like crab pots. So you never know where your ideas are going to come from. 
Um, this is the Arbor, uh, excuse me, this is Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge. This is um, a piece of land I go through to get to my property down in southern Dorchester County. And in the winter, they burn the marsh to get rid of the old growth and produce, produ uh, promote new growth. Uh, this is called tumble. It's got a combination of hibiscus, joe pie weed, and probably something else. I guess um, I am not very uh, engineered inclined, but I do like to try to make things like stand on their corners and all. So uh, it was fun to do. This is called incline. Uh, this is all hibiscus. You know, anybody drink this really red tea? That's what that plant is. Uh, this is called vanishing point. It's that uh, curly stuff is uh, sweet clover, which has a beautiful, beautiful smell. And the first few times I, up to like a couple years, I would exhibit it. The whole gallery would fill up with a great smell. It is finally faded, but it was nice while it lasted. And those are corn stalks. Uh, Revolution, this is hibiscus and uh, dog fennel. Um, this is called twist. It's basically dog fennel. The stalks and then those are the tips of the dog fennel that form that skirt kind of. This is uh, whir and it's dog fennel and uh, corn. Uh, this is called veil. It's bark. And the little outside shells, uh, one day I was walking and a plant had shed all its stems. And I try not to be a snob about my supplies, so I thought, well, I'll gather them up. They must have sat in my studio for at least a year. And then I got an idea and I used it. So... This is black water again in the winter, where parts of it are frozen. This is called currant, and it's straw. I absolutely love straw. Again, it's a beautiful, beautiful material. And people tend to think of these um, materials as ephemeral or um, easily disintegrated, but I still have this piece, and it's a very old piece, and I coat things with like paper mache and glue, and they pretty much last forever. Uh, descent. Oh, this is me building a piece in my backyard down at Toddville. That's the piece finished. Um, this is, there's a, a point where my work kind of changed. I'll go on. These are, um, Flower stems. I once was in a show at the Museum of the Americas in D.C., and it was in the wintertime, and they had all these flower stems they hadn't cut down, so I asked if I could have them, cut them down, and that's a piece that came from it. Uh, this is hosta leaves and um, I think maybe joe pie weed. That's the backyard at Tyville again. Signs me. Um, these are uh, phragmite leaves, you know, the tips. I don't know, you probably have them around here. Grow, they grow near the marshes and water. So you're probably pretty familiar with them. This is um, Flutter, and I uh, once went for an appointment, it was in the winter, and I saw the, uh, I guess they were hosta leaves, and they were, you know, I just carry my clippers around with me, and I would just get out and cut it. And the outside is, uh, I think it's, um, it's a vine. I can't think of the name of the vine, but I'll, I'll come in. This is called Metamorphosis. So the vines I gathered at the Arboretum, and the outside is um, marsh, uh, See, sometimes I remember what they are, and sometimes I don't. Marsh elder, excuse me. Again, um, honeysuckle vines and hibiscus. Uh, 
This is Phragmites and a type of grass that I don't know the name of. Switchgrass and um, that's uh, Phragmites. I'll just keep going. Now this piece, uh, the wood inside it is crepe myrtle. And my sister, who lived in North Carolina and came up to visit, took down a tree and she very graciously brought me some of the wood. And again, sometimes this, these materials sit around for a long time in my studio and then one day like a light bulb goes off and I say, aha, this is what I can do with it. Uh, this is apparition. So that's uh, Phragmites and the outside is dog fennel. This is called Tempest. Um, this is facade, um, jig, jig meaning something that holds something in place. This is crest, and at this point I'll just explain something. A lot of my materials are straight, you know, the Phragmites, the dog fennel, they're all straight. So I pretty much, a lot of my work was along the lines of a grid. And one day, somebody who wasn't even in art said to me, oh, all your work is pretty symmetrical. They didn't mean it as an insult, but it really shook something up in me. And I looked hard at my work, and I saw that they were right. And so it's not that the art was good or bad, but there was a certain maybe predictability about it, which I think really kind of bothered me. So I started gathering different material, and the different material are the wood you see in these sculptures, which are some of my latest pieces, is the pine wood. And the pine wood was twisted and gnarled and burnt, all the things I liked. So I started off in another direction. And I think that it's hard sometimes when you're working in a certain direction to like try to switch careers, but it does maybe help your work to evolve. I'll go a little faster. This is at an Arboretum. They invited me to do a few pieces. This is called Tickle, um, Serpentine, Dragon. Uh, this is called Disturbance. Uh, this is, um, I can't think of the name of this piece, but it's one of the first pieces where I started to use the pine wood. Heliotrope, which means growing towards the sun. This is another view of it. My work can look very different from different sides. Signal. Um, intersection. This was like one of the basic first pieces I did with the pine wood. Phantom. That's it. Um, if anybody has any questions or thoughts. This is where I get to step in and encourage our audiences. Let's give uh, Marsha a big round of applause. And if you have a little bit of stamina, could you throw one of your favorite pieces up back up on the slide? Yeah, sure. Would you be willing to talk a little bit with our audience and me? to answer a couple of questions. Sure, is there any piece that you, anybody's curious about? Yes. Um, uh, this is more like a general question about all of the sculptures. Um, I'm wondering what would be the right approach to one of these, like, um, my question is, how would I approach it to understand it the way that you want your audience to understand it? Uh, that's a good question. Or, um, the way that I'm supposed to interpret right. your, your work. Well, um, Basically, there's no answer to that question. Because um, I'm really pretty abstract in my approach to my art. So I feel like the lack of uh, knowing exactly what to get from it allows for a certain freedom. So when you approach it, it may be a little bit more work, actually, because there's nothing like, oh, this is a ship or this is a building, okay? 
So you need a willingness to like look at it, try to let it sink in maybe. You know, if it doesn't appeal to you, you know, but I guess I'm asking you to um, examine any kind of feelings you get from looking at the work. So, well, um, if you don't think it's interesting, then th that's that. But um, you might look at, like, how does it stand? Okay, or how does the piece stay together? And just ask yourself, um, is there anything that appeals to me about this? If there's, um, verbally, my work um, might not be easily described or interpreted, you know what I'm saying? But it's maybe kind of like a Rorschach test. When you look at it, what do you see? What do you get out of it? I don't particularly want to tell people, well, this is about this. I've heard this described, and in, in I think writing classes is where I stumbled across this, this, this issue. It's called the problem of authorship. What does a work mean? Yes. We as artists oftentimes have intents in our work. Right. But what this problem poses is that there are as many interpretations as there are authors. And when we come to a work of art, we're just one of the authors among many who come yes. to works of art yeah. and look at it and interpret it. And you, you said, hey, there's no representational aspects here. There are things like ships. Yes, nothing easily identifiable. But there are structures. And that's really interesting. And so you as a viewer might encounter a work of art like this and say, these structures remind me of things. Yes. Possibly in my life or in my experiences. These structures maybe evoke things. I think that's what I find. I'm a representational artist. I work with things that people can recognize. When I encounter works of art that aren't a ship or a building, I'm often asking myself, how does this make me feel? which is a different type of response. Do I feel at ease? How do they make you feel? Right. You're one of the authors. Well, my inspiration really comes from the physical world, okay? So in the sculptures, it's more obvious it comes from nature. My work has kind of always been about nature. But the physical world, in the drawings, it's the same, it's a physical world also, but I read some things like quantum physics for dummies. And I don't understand a lot of what I read, but I do understand a little bit. And the ideas of like the collision of particles that maybe create a new particle and they go flying off in different directions. So it's still the same physicality, but it's on like a subatomic level. It's not really evident to the eye. So the physicality of things is really what my work's about, if that makes any sense. That's a pretty good answer. Oh, good, good. I'll go ahead. Thank you. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get structure. I, I thank you for doing this, because I go over this in my head, but sometimes I lose track that other people are not in my head. So you know this old joke? There's an old joke. Writing about art is a little bit like dancing about architecture. <laughs> and, and artists are really good visual communicators, aren't we? And occasionally people come to us and say, well, what does your work mean? And we go, well, of course I know what my work means. It's obvious. <laughs> Look at what my work means. And that's generally where we're, we're at artistically a lot of the time. Right. But, but notice that influences from outside things that we might have expected. An interest in quantum physics and a structure to the invisible world around us begins to inform yes, it does. the visible world around us, which is really kind of interesting. Can I, can I feed you a question? Would you guys mind if I jumped in here and, and, and asked a question myself? Sure. So a lot of us, a lot of us, 
think about art supplies as coming from someplace like a store. Do you go and get your sticks at the store or do you? <laughs> no, some of my sticks, because I couldn't find the dog fennel sometimes, some of my art supplies come from Ikea, okay? Which, <laughs> well, they sell bundles of the willow. Okay. And I guess they're selling it for decorative purposes. But I started to build things out of them. And so the twine, which is hemp twine, comes from, a lot of times, Walmart. And the, uh, some of it's coated with uh, walnut ink, and the walnut ink comes from the Maryland Institute Art Supply Store. Well, what I really like about that approach to sourcing your materials um, from things like natural plant sources, even if we're getting them from a supplier of some right. type, is that it's really traditionally the way pre-industrial revolution, when things were sold in stores, we got everything. All of our glues and our string and our fabric and our clothes right. were all sourced locally. And I think we lose some of that connection with the natural world as we forget where things come from. Right. And so it's really interesting to see how something like your proximity to the salt marshes yes. visually informs your material choices and the work. Right. And the, I think also the point is, is that you can make art out of anything. So it's not like you, oh, um, I see a burnt tree trunk for the grail. Oh, I can't use that for art. I mean, it forces you to open up to new materials and new experiences and really not scratch anything off the list. Because in a way, everything has potential. And I try not to be a snob about the materials I use, you know, because, um, you don't know what the potential is until you start working with the materials. And it's really a lot of fun to discover new things to work with. It forces you to examine the world around you more closely. I like that. I think like wood is a category, like just a big category. We lump everything into wood. Right. But I bet you, working with different types of trees, notice that there's a difference between willow oh, yes. and crepe willow. Yes. And just the physical qualities that those plants have, although we all call them wood, are unique and, and unique properties to that thing. And 150 years ago, that wouldn't have been secret knowledge. It would have been knowledge that each of us would have been intimate with because we would have needed those things and to understand their properties. Let's get another question from the audience. Who's way back there? Hey, Megan. Hey. How you doing? Uh, thank you so much for coming and sharing your work. Sure. Um, thank you for coming here. Yeah, and look at um, it. I love hearing you talk about in your PowerPoint and just now that like uh, discovery, right? The joy and process of discovery. And I've heard you all talk a lot about it with the, the three dimensional forms. I was curious if you could talk a little bit about like what that discovery looks like when you're working on the works on paper. Oh, like, okay. Is, it, is, it, is that how it is? Maybe it's something different. I don't know. I just was hoping to hear um, that. Well, I want to refer back to something else, but I just want to make a comment that your work using the denim in a sculptural way, <laughs> a plot, it has the same thing. It really You're doing that. the same thing. So real knows real, that's what the kids say, right? We understand each other. In, in, in our, our efforts towards materiality for meaning, sometimes materials have Right, meaning. I mean, who, who, when do you throw a piece of, uh, when do you throw your pair of jeans on the bed and think, well, that could be a sculpture. Never, until you start working with the material itself. And then you find out the potential in it. Or you encounter somebody who's working with grass harvested from their backyard, and you think, I never thought to do that. And that's the, the type of potentials that have an artist like Wolfson Ray come and talk to us about the work afford us. But let's talk about those drawings. Uh, oh, OK. Well, um, in the sculpture, I used to, uh, I'm going to refer back, it will be connected. I used to make sketches. You know, I come up with the idea and I make a sketch. And I pretty much built the piece 
to resemble the sketch. So it was fairly predictable all along the way. But when that person made the comment about the symmetricalness of my work, and I guess it bothered him, it, it lodged in my brain, it bothered me, um, I started another approach. I, when I started to use the wood, the pine wood, I just took the wood and I'd arbitrarily drill holes in it. So, and then I just used the willow as a dale to go through it, and then I'd start attaching it. And so my whole process changed that I would never really, when I started a piece, I had no idea what it would look like finished. I could never make a drawing because as I was working, it became, it was uh, a certain randomness involved, which again kind of goes back to the physics, which I was totally attracted to, just the randomness and not knowing where you're going or what your piece was going to involve involved in, with. The drawings was uh, a, a lot of times, uh, well, in the past, I didn't have a lot of time because I was working and trying to do the art and the sculpture took all, all the time. But uh, back in 2020, I had a knee operation and I was laid up for a while and in bed and I really couldn't do the sculpture. So I had a pack of colored pencils around and I just started drawing with them. Well, you know, I think that many, artists suffer from an obsessive uh, approach. So I started doing more and more drawings. But the thing that bothered me, bothered me was that um, the randomness that I was uh, working with in the sculptures, I, um, I wanted kind of that same approach in the drawings. But the drawings were more cerebral. So what I started to do was I take things like um, stencils and straight edges and those mechanical curves and I just started placing them all over the page and then I would start and then I would start intersecting things to try to get that feeling of randomness in the drawings in the same way <coughs> that the uh, wood the sculptures had so I, I don't know if, um, but that kind of led me down a different path too. But I guess in my art, I like the idea of a lack of control. So as you're working, you know, sometimes you get like, you, you learn what things are going to do. So you work more and more for the idea of controlling it. But in a strange way, to me, that, uh, not dead in something, but it, again, it veers back to that predictability, which I don't enjoy too much. So the drawings were my attempt in a two-dimensional way to get a certain a spontaneous and randomness. I don't know if it comes across in the drawings. I'm still working on the drawings. I have a little more time now, so they keep evolving. Well, what's really interesting, too, is you guys haven't had a chance yet to go up close and examine these drawings, but what, what's interesting is they become more complex visually the closer you get to them, okay. which is a lot like quantum physics, right? As we drill down into reality, reality gets weird. <laughs> yes. Reality is under no obligation to make sense of us. We're just at a certain scale where things seem to make sense. So as we get smaller or larger in terms of our perception, the world's complexity kind of reveals yes. just how chaotic the nature of reality actually is. And those drawings behave a little bit like that. Let me, let me see if I can get another question. Sure. Is there a student out there who needs a good grade and wants to impress their teacher? Raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to you, sir. Sit on your hands. Come on, be brave. What do you, what do you think about, what do you think, oh, there's one. Um, for your Before you answer that, I'm going to repeat it back. I'm sure. going to be a microphone back to the camera. The question is, are you meant to view these, these sculptures that are on the floor from all different sides? Is that, about right? Okay. Well, that's a really good question. And I have to say, my 
intention is that um, there is no front or back. And as I'm working on them, I continually turn them. But sometimes I think they do wind up having one side being a front and one side being the back. So I, again, I don't know how they hit people, but um, I'm hoping that even coming at them from an odd direction, they still produce an effect. But sometimes I do think that they're kind of one side that's, you know, a little stronger than another. What do they remind you guys of? <coughs> What's the first thing that pops into your head when you look at something <laughs> like that? Try to keep it PG-13. What, what do you see? What do you see? <coughs> Not an owl pellet, like in biology class? Who remembers dissecting owl pellets? Finding all the little bones inside. A few of us have done that. Or maybe something like a, a plume of smoke. Yes. Or a tornado. So it's really interesting to me from a formalist standpoint, how things are kind of structured and put together is that even in non-objective work, work that isn't intended to look like anything, an instructor will push you on the point, on, on the hot seat and embarrass you in front of everybody and say, what do you think it looks like? What we're stretching for is bad analogies. What is something like? Is it like a cloud? Is it like a tornado? Right. And oftentimes, those analogies and metaphors are what artists are putting into their work. Um, what would this feel like? Yeah, what, what would this feel like if you touched it? To use a couple of adjectives. Uh, rough. Rough. Yeah. Good. That's one. Give me another. What's another word for rough? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I didn't know it was going to be a pop quiz. <laughs> Nobody told me there'd be a test. Uh, R. Hard. Rough, prickly, spiky, spiky. Now they're flowing, aren't they? Yes. Those, those are things that are analogous to other things. So when we look at these things, we've had experiences with other objects. Yes. What else is rough and prickly and hard? Go back to you. Oh, I lost it. Oh. <laughs> no, I won't. What is up? What else? <laughs> <laughs> well, the other rough and prickly and hard. Keep it PG-13. Your mom's in the back. Uh, cactus. Cactuses are like that. What's, what's an animal that's like that? Porcupine. Porcupine. What's an emotion that's like that? Jealousy. Ooh. Anxiety. Anxiety. Jealousy. <laughs> hatred. Those are also things like life that can be prickly and hard and jagged and rough. All the time? Hopefully not. Sometimes? Sometimes. Yes. What do you think about those interpretations of your work? They're probably different from your interpretations of your own work. Well, that's kind of the point of working the way I do. That whatever you're bringing to it is pretty much OK. I would, it's like, um, if somebody came up to the, this one and said, it reminds me of the Statue of Liberty. You know what, I wouldn't argue with them, okay? Because um, I really think that art is kind of what you're bringing to it. And I would never say, oh, it doesn't look like that. Because if I wanted it to be a specific thing, I would probably be working differently. So um, I'm influenced things by like architecture, by nature. So those are my influences in the quantum world. But um, there's really, I don't think there's any right or wrong involved in my work. And I think if it appeals to you, you will take the time to look at it and maybe walk around it and look at it from another direction. See if we got time for one more question. Sure. What do you guys think? You got one more question out there? 
Go ahead. So I noticed in like some of your pieces, like the title of them, like looked like your work. Do you name the title after you make your project or before? That's a really good question. Um, when I was um, when I started painting, and it was I was heavily influenced by Paul Clay. I really got into the titles. So uh, one of the titles was the effect of uh, new physics on dogs, cats, children, and birds. The other one was the, uh, the incessant calling of the crows electrifies the air. They were a lot more, uh, I guess, literary. But when I started working with these, I really couldn't do that. And I, I actually didn't want to. So one of the reasons um, to name something is really a practical reason. So like, you can identify it. So you, somebody looked at your work and they say, oh, I saw a twist. And then it's, oh, yes, I know what that piece is, OK? But the uh, name might get its source from the look of it. Or it might just be a feeling that I get from it. But it's lost its literal interpretation that it had when I was doing those original drawings. So, and it's really something I struggle with now, especially for the drawings. Did, did you notice that with those longer titles, it changed the way people viewed the work? Well, the work was much more, um, uh, how should I say this? They told little stories. So they were more um, graphic and uh, literary in their approach. Because that was my influence from Paul Clay. He did things that were very, like, um, like you'd say literary. And I mean, that's my interpretation. He, he was in this room. He'd probably throw a book at my head. But the thing of it is, is um, Titles sometimes are a struggle because I really don't want to say something like this piece is, is a boat for a title because then you're going to look at it and say, oh, where's that boat? I, I don't really want to do that. I want to kind of leave it, I usually pick like an ephemeral quality nail to name a piece. So it's kind of ambiguous, you know. It might be a quality that they see in it. But it's not a defining factor. I don't know if that makes sense to you, you know. But I, I don't want to be so literal anymore. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step in here for just a moment and say thank you all so much for coming and oh, attending the you. talk. Let's give uh, Marsha a big round of applause. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I'd like to invite you all back. At 4.30, we have a reception with a little bit of food. If you're a little shy and didn't feel like you could ask your question in yes. public, that's I'll a great time yes. to get to know this wonderful person. Thank you. And, and take the opportunity. Um, you're going to mind your professors after three semesters. You're going to know everything that we know. You have Marsha today. So come talk to Marsha a little bit at the reception, get a little free food. It's really a great place to invite somebody. You got a buddy that you're thinking about having. Say, would you like to go with me to the gallery reception? Use your words. They might say yes. If they need a little convincing, say, there's food. <laughs> yes, definitely say that. <laughs> and, and you can come and rather than talk to each other about anything, you can look at interesting works of art Thank and you can you. say, how does that make you feel? And then you can learn a lot about that person while discussing art. That's one of the primary uses of art, is to reveal other humans. Um, let's give her one more round of applause. Thank you, Mr. No problem. Thank you very much. Also, I'd like to point out that if you are one of our visual art students, there's a CDW sign-up sheet at the back of the room on your way out, or if you need to, to break real quick. Come back and sign that sheet with your email address so that we can get you logged as a CDW event. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.